Hi. Good morning. What a beautiful day it is today. Anybody watching the Steelers later today? Oh, we got a couple. For, man, I'm t there's, there's some more good. Maybe 2-0. Oh. Maybe 2-0. Oh. We'll see. All right. Buccaneers, yeah. <laughs> oh, goodness. It's great to live where we have freedom to be able to do these things. Uh, my name is Pastor Mark, and we are in a sermon series on taking God seriously. If you're here, I would imagine you want to take God seriously at least. Um, today's topic is a little different, um, but it's nonetheless super important, super foundational to your Christian walk. Taking God seriously includes fellowship. There's no way around it. We are called to be in community. We are called to fellowship with one another. We're going to be in Ecclesiastes today, the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. Um, interesting book, Ecclesiastes. It's one of my favorite. Um, for years, I struggled with depression brought on by anxiety, and God has helped me learn that, that all those thought processes are a gift if I use them correctly. So praise the Lord, He has helped me through that. But if you struggle with depression, pick up the book in, of Ecclesiastes and read it. I don't know why it spoke to me so deeply because it starts out, everything is meaningless. Well, that's kind of the way you feel when you're depressed, right? So you kind of, there's a common chord there. Um, there's an old saying, there are no Lone Ranger Christians. We need each other, period. And the book of Ecclesiastes was written by King Solomon. It's just fascinating to me, King Solomon's um, story, uh, his background, um, became the richest man to ever walk the face of the earth and who will ever walk the face of the earth. Nobody will accumulate the wealth King Solomon had. The Bible says wealth was so abundant in his kingdom that silver was like dust. It was meaningless. Like, can you imagine silver being worthless because there's so much gold? I think one queen uh, had brought him 666 talents of gold every year just in honor of him. And that's like tons of gold. Like, do the math. Like, an ounce of gold's over $1,000. Can you imagine tons of gold? Wasn't even close. So with all that... And then on top of that, King Solomon's dad was uh, David, and um, when it was Solomon's turn, God talked to him directly and said, whatever you want, I'll give you. And it was a test from God. You don't know it till you read on, and Solomon passed because he asked, of all the things he could ask for, he asked for wisdom. He knew he was getting ready to handle his God's chosen people, and he wanted the wisdom to be able to do so appropriately. And God really liked that answer. And he said, you know what? Good answer. You get it all. <laughs> Not only am I going to give you wisdom, I'm going to give you riches. I'm going to give you everything. And boy, did he ever. So Solomon took all that wealth and all that wisdom he had, and he searched for the meaning of life. Can you imagine having everything at your disposal and go to search for the meaning of life? I had very little at my disposal in my late teens and 20s, and I searched hard for the meaning of life. <laughs> Woo, did I find a lot of wrong answers. <laughs> so did Solomon. It's okay. We're in good company. He found a lot of wrong answers. He tried everything. He threw the biggest parties. For, he threw parties that lasted a month. He had a harem of thousands of women. He built cities. He built gardens. He did everything. And in the end, all of that toil, all of that labor without God is meaningless. Wisdom is meaningless. Pleasures are meaningless. Folly is meaningless. Toil is meaningless. Advancement is meaningless. Riches are meaningless. And he expounded on many things like that, including being alone. And that's the section we're in today, Ecclesiastes 4, 7 through 12. And he found that to be meaningless as well. There are no Lone Ranger Christians. And I'm, 
I'm kind of a loner. Uh, God has a funny sense of humor how things come around. I have my youngest granddaughter is like a flashback. Like when I see her, like I literally have flashbacks of being that age. She could be alone. She actually would prefer to be alone, I believe. Um, she's able to take care of herself, have fun, and wants to be left alone. Leave me alone. But when we leave, <laughs> oh, man, there's nobody who grabs Papa and Gigi harder and cries harder. It's, there's insight in that. I think even the least people of persons don't know how much they need people, how much we need people. Hmm. Ecclesiastes 4, starting in verse 7. King Solomon says, Again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable business. I'm going to stop there for a second. A man all alone, no son, no brother. You might feel sorry for him, but I think in the next verse, he worked hard and he had wealth. It's not like he was poor. He worked hard, but he was alone, and he wasn't content with his wealth. <laughs> Who am I toiling for? If you're a non people person, and you're a loner, and, and you work, like, who are you working for? What's the end game? I'm not trying to be mean or anything. I'm just wondering. Do you ever ask yourself that? Because you can't take it with you. And the Bible's clear about how we are to be in community. I mean, it is all throughout the Bible. You don't have to go far. As a matter of fact, the second chapter of the Bible, Genesis 2, God literally says, uh, it's not good for man to be alone. Genesis 2, 18. The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. Some older married people might disagree from time to time on that but they'd be miserable alone as well. Um, Sherry's been at the retreat all weekend, and I had a very, very peaceful day yesterday. But man, when she's not gone, I'm just not myself. I'm just not. She completes me. And uh, God's right. It is not good for man to be alone. I asked, if you're a loner, a loner, what are you working for? Uh, what's the end game? I'm sure Solomon was surrounded by people, but he probably felt lonely too. You know, he's the king and like, it would be really hard to have a genuine relationship with somebody who you could open up to if you're the king, you're at the top. And I would imagine he had a sense of loneliness as well, even with all that wealth. So why is that bad, <laughs> right? I mean, there are some times when I just don't want to be around people, and we need those times, but that's, the, that's not the norm. Why is it bad to be alone? Well, one of my favorite passages that is so descriptive when you break it down comes from 1 Peter uh, chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, and it is a warning to all of us as Christians. It says, be alert. And of sober mind, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Nobody knows what I'm going through. Uh, no. <laughs> That's fellowship. There's a lot, this world is not an easy place, and just because you're a Christian doesn't mean everything's sunshine and bubbles, and that just compounds the fact that we need each other. We need one another. Anybody, I grew up watching uh, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. That's way back when. What was the man's name that was in charge of that? Marlon something. And he had his trusty assistant, Jim, who always got sent in. Like, Marlon never did anything. He's sitting in the Jeep, and Jim's out there running with the lions, man. That always cracked me up. 
Oh, goodness. But when you watch shows like that, and you see those lions or lionesses, and there's a big herd of wildebeest, who do they go after? That one little wildebeest who just kind of did like I did, wanted to be left alone. Found a nice little patch of grass, and the herd kind of wandered away, but there it is by itself. Be careful. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. If you are a loner, you are most likely, you're at the top of the list. Oh, I got one all alone. Nobody around. Just wait. Satan's just licking his chops. That's what he does. That is a never-ending daily thing until Jesus comes back. Satan is going to be doing that. He never stops throwing fiery darts. He never stops coming after you. And if you don't stand firm in the faith and surround yourself with other believers, you are vulnerable. Period. And you can have all the money in the world and it won't matter. You can have all the money in the world and not be content. We are meant to fellowship. What's more proof? Acts 2.42, we preached this a few weeks ago. The big four, the fab four of the Christian life, Acts 2.42, look it up. They devoted themselves. These are the original apostles when the church was started, and these are the four things they devoted themselves to. Here's what we're going to do as Christians. This is what details the Christian life. What is it? Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. That's the word. To fellowship. That's second on the list devoted themselves to it, not like, hey, what's up? We haven't seen each other for a while. When are we getting together? Ah, soon. Okay. Six months later, hey, what's up? That's not fellowship. That's not devoting yourself to it. That's playing at it. And they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread, communion, and to prayer. Uh, the original church devoted themselves to fellowship. Look up that word devotion, devoted. And then reconcile that with what you're devoted to in your life. See where it falls on the scales. Verse 9. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity Anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? First service. My rebellious side just never stops. I read that. How can one keep warm alone? And the smart aleck in me was like electric blanket. <laughs> Goodness, God has worked on me a long time. Let me tell you what, even an electric blanket won't do it. At my grandparents' old house, it's dated back to the 1790s, and it got so cold upstairs with an electric blanket on, you woke up in the morning and your snot was ice. I kid you not. Ask my mom, she'll tell you. You had to wear a toboggan. Yeah. You need, we need each other, we need each other. <laughs> Two are better than one. Many hands make light work. Pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Why do we avoid hanging out with other Christians? Why do we do it? Why do we avoid asking for help? I think part of it is the enemy. He knows. So he, he compounds the fact, oh, you shouldn't bother them. You can do it on your own. We've got this sick sense of Christian nationalism today that just has gone too far uh, where we just want to be mavericks and we want to do it all ourselves. And that's, that is not biblical. I think the enemy has some to do with it and I think pride, pride. Pride comes before the fall, right? Doesn't the Bible say that? And pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Hmm, here's your sign. And here's the other thing. If we're too prideful to ask for help or hang out with other Christians, are we going to be available to help others in need? Some of the most helpful people aren't afraid to ask for help themselves. That's kind of how it works.
And fellowship is, true Christian fellowship doesn't have an agenda. Okay? Don't have the attitude of what's in it for me when you're seeking Christian fellowship. It's okay to start there, but I believe you'll find that that's not at the root of it. I believe you'll find that what can I do for others will open up such a door for what others do for you, you'll never have to ask that question again. That's the way his economy works. Fellowship has no agenda, no selfishness, just a desire to be obedient to God. Um, 1 John 1, 3 through 7 gives a wonderful picture of Christian fellowship. 1 John 1, 3 through 7 in a microcosm basically is our fellowship is with God and with Jesus Christ, his son. And you come into that. We all join into that with each other. It is, it's such a giant fellowship. It's not just... Christians, but it's God, His Son, His Holy Spirit moving in and through all of us. It's so powerful, has incredible power. You have no idea. And there's a lot of people who need our help, who need fellowship desperately. I think of widows and orphans and single parents trying to make it through this world. What's James have to say about that? Jesus' brother, James 1.27 says, Religion that God's, God accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. That screams of fellowship. Well, there's a religious person. He's a religious person. No offense, I don't like being called a religious person. I'm not religious. I just love Jesus. Like, call that religious if you like. But if you want to find out what religion is and acceptable to God, go no further than his word. Religion that God set, accepts as pure and faultless. You cannot go wrong doing these things. Looking after orphans and widows in their distress and keeping yourself from being polluted by the world. And let me tell you what, if you do the first part of that, well, the second part falls away. Because if you're busy enough trying to help somebody out and fellowship with them and shine the light of Christ to them, you're not going to be thinking about being polluted by the world. It just it naturally takes care of itself. We try so hard just to be good and to do the right thing and to not do the wrong thing that if we just go out helping people, love God and love people, boom, that's it. What's the greatest commandment? Jesus was asked point blank, what is the greatest commandment? And he says, simple. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Period. That's it. How simple is that? It doesn't get any simpler. Not easy, but simple. Not, sim not easy, but simple. Not only do we fellowship for, with Christians for our own good, for the greater good, we got a job to do. We're ambassadors of Christ, Paul says. We're official representatives of him. And if you don't have somebody to hold you accountable, you will be polluted by the world. If you isolate yourself and you refuse to be held accountable, you'll be polluted by the world. It's just plain and simple. Without Jesus, the world wins. It just does. You can't resist, like you just can't resist it. You could try. I tried. Tried every way possible to have Jesus halfway in my life or not at all. It doesn't work. It does not work. Fellowship is the same way with him that it is with everybody else. You've got to be all in. You've got to be willing. You've got to want it. If we're not looking out for others, how can the love of Christ be in us? 1 John 3.17 basically says that. 
If you see a brother in need and you don't help him, like how, how can the love of Christ be in you? <laughs> and this passage we're talking about today is not just for husband and wives or couples. It's for every type of relationship across the board. We should be looking for opportunities to fellowship instead of running and hiding at home. And let me tell you, I called my home my fortress of solitude. I was a Superman fan growing up. And being not a peoply person, and I, I grew up most of my life in sales. Like, I had to go out every day and face, like, six business owners and try to sell them something. And at least five of them said no every day. Ugh. Gosh, I just want to go home and be left alone. And you sit there and you stew and you get nothing done and you get fatter and it's just like it's, ugh. <laughs> you can run all you want. God's going to, he'll catch up one way or another. It's just, it's crazy. Like just, you might as well just throw up the white flag. Verse 12, we'll finish this up. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Boy, that last line, and this is something that the Holy Spirit gave me while we were praying back there before second service. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Think about that. That is a good thing in Christian fellowship. But when you get in with the wrong group and you entangle yourself into that wrong group, it ain't quickly broken, man. Oh, my gosh, did that hit me hard today. Whew. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. James. So be careful about how you fellowship. There is a proper way to fellowship, and there is a very improper way to fellowship. And I've tried them both, and they're pretty obvious polar opposites. They really are. Don't fool yourself. You know what's wrong and what's right. So, think about being in a strange city, okay? You're traveling, you're all alone, and you're in a strange city, and you decide to go for a walk, and you get turned around, and you don't have your phone, and you're lost, and it's getting dark, and the neighborhoods are getting meaner, and the people are getting meaner, and you're in a dark alley. And here comes a stranger, look mean, looking, intent. Would you rather be by yourself, or would you rather have somebody with you at that point? I can take care of myself, but I'd rather have somebody with me at that point, honestly. Why do we wait till things get extreme? Why do we do that? The tortoise and the hare, man. We're too much like the hare sometimes. We run every which way, and before we know it, the race is over, and the turtle won because he was slow and steady. The world is a strange place. You don't have to be in a strange city. You could be in Toronto pumping gas and something weird happens and you're all alone. <laughs> like, seriously. You could be all alone and you got to start your car and the battery's dead and you have no, like, you, we need people. We need people. Who can you call on to help you in a time of need when you're feeling overpowered? I know a whole room full of people. And Christian fellowship is not just a Sunday thing. Do you know there's 168 hours in the week? Take out 56 hours for sleeping. That's 112 waking hours every week. One to two hours of fellowship, if you think that's enough, you're, you're fooling yourself. You really are. And I, I get it. Like, I've shared this before in my younger days. The last people I ever wanted to hang out with was a bunch of Christians. Like, honestly. And I grew up in church, but, I, like, they're boring, they're no fun, this and that. You know why I felt like that? Because I liked living in my sin. I enjoyed it, and I didn't like somebody telling me it was wrong, and I knew it was wrong. So you make up your mind to say, oh, those Christians are just boring and no fun, and blah, blah, blah while I'm out there destroying myself. You live long enough, 
God smacks you to your senses sometimes. He just does. He wounds, but he binds up, is what it says. <laughs> Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, another verse that just bolsters the foundation that we have to fellowship. It says, consider how you may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Don't we see the day approaching all the more every single day? What are we supposed to do? Encourage one another more and more and more. Not discourage one another. Not, man, look how bad things are, man. The church is dying, man. Things are awful. I'm just going to hide in my house till Jesus comes back. That's the opposite. <laughs> The church is victorious. The church is the bride of Christ. Act like it. There's great strength in numbers. And people generally want to be involved with something that's bigger than them. Look at it. Look across. There's anything you can imagine there's a club for. Bassmasters, uh, NRA, uh, Hell's Angels, whatever. And you look at the core foundation of each and every single group, and it's people with common interests that is a uh, part of an organization, a thing that's bigger than them, uh, that uh, where you can have a sense of purpose and you can make a difference. Like, we've got that. We've got it to the nth degree. We have the way, the truth, and the life. We have the best possible organization you could belong to. And thrive in. We've got it. Act like it. <laughs> Spread it. Man. The more people, the better. I love how he closes this out. The one may be overpowered. Two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. And it gets stronger with four and five and six and seven. Look at those cables they build those big bridges with, man. Awesome. We've got to devote ourselves to locking arms and doing the work God has for us within our gifting and doing it joyfully and with thankful hearts, waiting for that great reward when we have glorified bodies in the end. Amen? Like, good night. Good things are coming. Good things are here. Let's get together. Let's get together. Because life alone is meaningless. Anything without God and his people is meaningless. I'm telling you. You can try. Go try. Knock yourself out. Because I've done it. And Solomon closed Ecclesiastes, and this is how we'll close today in chapter 12. <laughs> Richest and most wise man to ever walk the earth gave his conclusion on life. You have access to that. That is so special. Like we take this for granted. These are great words of advice. I would say heed them. And he says, here is the conclusion of the matter. I searched it all, people. I got more money than you'll ever have, and I searched it all. I did everything, and here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments because that's the duty of all mankind. That's your duty, to fear God and keep his commandments because God's going to bring every deed into judgment, whether good or bad, including every hidden thing, good or evil. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And he expects us to make a difference. And you can't make a difference being a lone ranger Christian. You need people and people need you. Period. And we've got so many ways to get you started. So many ways. It's not going to burn you out. So see me. If you're hungry to devote yourself to fellowship, we got all the food you want. <laughs> we'll fill you up.
Let's pray. God, you are good, and I just thank you for your word, and I thank you for people, especially hearts that seek you, Lord. I pray that um, we would see other Christians as gold, as pure gold. Um, and we should dig for that gold, and we're going to go through a lot of dirt to find it, Lord. But I pray that we would be patient with one another that we would encourage one another as we see the day approaching and that we would be joyful as we do it knowing that the whole body of believers throughout the world is experiencing the same kind of hardships and we have you and we have eternal life to count on so our light and momentary troubles are earning for us a righteousness in heaven lord and we await for that Show us what it looks like to be in fellowship, Lord, and may we devote ourselves to that in Jesus' name.